Have you ever wondered how magnets work? How can atoms inside a magnet align to create a strong magnetic field? Well, wonder no more. I'll present a mathematical model that can explain it all. But be warned, this model is a really hard sum that makes all other sums look like a game of tic-tac-toe. If you're ready for a challenge or some headache, if you take it seriously, then you've come to the right place. How does a mathematical model look like that describes how tiny atoms or their spins interact with each other? Each spin can be either up or down. This property is captured inside a variable s that can take the values plus or minus one. The spins are arranged on a lattice, kind of like a really tiny game of checkers. Inside the lattice, each spin can interact with its nearest neighbors and an external magnetic field. Physicists are able to obtain all observables of such a system from one single sum. They call this sum partition function. In the exponential you find the ratio between the energy of each configuration of spins and the temperature. The sum is performed over all possible configurations, and there are a lot of them. If you just consider 250 spins, you have about as many configurations as atoms in the universe. The second term in the energy is an interaction term with an external magnetic field. Each spin of the lattice simply gets multiplied by this field, and the sign of the spin determines how it contributes to the total energy. The first term features the sum over all nearest neighbor interactions. Here is where it gets interesting. If a particular spin is aligned with its neighbors as well as possible, the energy of the system is reduced. In other words, if a spin is surrounded by spins that are all pointing in the same direction, it's more stable than if its neighbors are pointing in different directions. This is kind of how you might feel more comfortable hanging out with people who have similar interests to you. But here's the kicker. Even though the definition of the icing model is relatively simple, it's hard to solve for large systems. However, in 1944, the Norwegian physicist Lars Onsager was able to find an exact solution for the infinitely large two-dimensional icing model. In this video, first solutions to small systems are investigated where the sum can easily be calculated with a computer. These solutions can be used to explain physical properties of magnets. And eventually, we'll have a look at the terrific solution of the sum for an infinite two-dimensional lattice, which makes the Ising model that was proposed by the German physicist Ernst Ising to one of the most important models whenever you want to speak about second-order phase transitions. I'm pleased to present this video as my contribution to the third round of the Summer of Math Exposition. My protagonist of this presentation is the partition function of the Ising model. Explicit computations and simulations will reveal the true depth of its significance and importance. Additionally, real-life experiments will help to establish the connection between this partition function and physical observables. These experiments introduce the notion of magnetization and heat capacity, which turn out to be very useful to understand the phenomenon of phase transitions. Let's conduct a little experiment. Imagine a humble steel needle and a few paper clips. Nothing much to write home about, right? But hold on tight. When the needle touches the paper clips, there's no magical reaction. However, when the needle is exposed to a strong magnetic field, it's like a spell has been cast. All the spins inside the needle align and the needle itself develops a magnetic field. And suddenly the paper clips are drawn to the needle and cling to it as if their lives depend on it. Typically, when demonstrating this experiment in a classroom setting, the teacher might ask students to estimate whether the needle has gained or lost energy after coming into contact with the magnet. To carry over some interactivity into this video, there are two comments prepared in the comment section. So please hit the pause button and support the comment that agrees with your opinion. And don't be shy, feel free to reply with some arguments to back up your choice. Let's see who can bring the strongest magnetic argument to the table. Of course, if the icing model is a faithful representation of our magnetized needle, the answer will have been given already. 
The alignment of spins decreases the internal energy of the needle, since each spin is now surrounded by only friends and has come down to its most relaxed state. This new configuration of aligned spins should be so energetically favorable that it persists even at room temperature, creating a stable phase of the needle that's unaffected by fluctuations. There is a very violent demonstration of this persistence. Guess how high the temperature has to be raised to destroy the alignment of spins. This temperature is known as Curie temperature, named after the French physicist Pierre Curie, husband of the even more famous Polish physicist Marie Curie. At the Curie temperature, the needle's magnetization is lost. By this point, enough heat energy has been supplied to break the alignment of spins into a completely random configuration. The needle has undergone a phase transition, losing all its magnetic beauty. In our model of spins, this transition is easily understood. After the magnetization of the needle, all spins point into the same direction, causing an extended magnetic field that is responsible for the attraction of the paper clip. Since this state is a state of low energy, it is stable against small perturbations such as temperature fluctuations. At some point, however, the raise of temperature increases the internal energy of the needle and at some critical temperature, the order of the ground state is lost and the spins undergo a transition to disordered orientations and the needle loses its magnetization. So how can we calculate the magnetization of the needle? Well, we can start by considering the spins inside the needle. If all the spins point in the same direction, then the magnetization of the needle will be at its maximum. Conversely, if half of the spins point in one direction, while the other half points towards the opposite direction, then the magnetization will be zero. However, this is also a state of high internal energy. Since every spin is immersed in a sea of both companions and adversaries. And if all the spins point in the opposite direction, another ground state is reached. The magnetization will be at its maximum again, but this time the north and south pole are interchanged. Therefore, the magnetization can simply be calculated as the average value for the sum of all spins. One last step before the first partition function is actually computed will explain how exactly the magnetization is obtained from the partition function. Since the spins cannot be measured directly, they are therefore treated as random variables. Observable quantities are often linked to the expectation values of these random variables. As a simple example for the calculation of an expectation value, let's roll 100 dice. It is easy to find the sum of all the values. To inject a touch of excitement into this otherwise mundane task, the dice are gathered and color-coded based on their numerical values. Likewise, the mean value can be calculated. In this specific case, simply each individual part of the sum is divided by the total number of dice. In fact, a similar calculation can be performed without relying on any specific outcome of an experiment. To do so, the relative frequencies for the occurrence of 1, 2, 3, etc. are replaced by the corresponding probabilities. In case of a fair dice, each number appears with a chance of 1 6. Therefore, a straightforward calculation leads to an average value of 3.5. This quantity is commonly known as the expectation value of the random variable that is linked to the dice and its numerical outcome. A similar expectation value can be calculated for the magnetization of our array of spins. The dice are replaced by the spin variables S1 to Sn and the different outcomes of experiments correspond to different spin configurations. The probability for a given spin configuration is given by the exponential of the ratio between the energy and the temperature, and the denominator makes sure that all probabilities add up to 1. Then the expectation value for the sum of all spins can be computed by the sum of all configurations weighted by their probabilities. If it was only for the pre-computation of this denominator, the knowledge of the partition function would not be a big deal of relief. One still had to perform this tedious sum. But viewers with a little knowledge of calculus and a keen eye for the detail can make an amazing discovery that simplifies our calculations immensely. 
Remember that the interaction term with the external magnetic field in the energy was nothing but the product of the spin sum with the external magnetic field. At this point it pays off to have introduced the term in the first place. The magnetization is obtained from the derivative of the logarithm of the partition function with respect to the external magnetic field. The partition function only depends on the temperature and the external magnetic field, but it still contains all the bits of information we need to make this summation process completely unnecessary. This last formula holds the key for connecting the partition function to real experiments and simulations. Now it's time to actually calculate the partition function for a simple lattice of a few spins. Additionally, a simulation for these spins is set up with a few lines of code and the results from both sides are compared. Here is where the fun starts. Everything is presented in a way that it can easily be extended to larger models. But for the sake of simplicity, let's consider a grid with three lattice sides only in each direction. It's a small yet powerful model that promises to reveal the fundamental principles of the Ising model in a way that's easy to grasp. First, one has to understand the computation of the energy. It will obviously depend on the state of every spin. There are two contributions to this energy function. The first part arises from the interaction with an external magnetic field and it is relatively easy to understand. The strength of the external field is multiplied by each spin, making each spin's contribution equal in magnitude. If the spin aligns with the external magnetic field, the energy lowers but if it doesn't, the energy increases. Obviously, if the number of spins pointing upwards was equal to the number of spins pointing downwards, the total contribution to the energy would vanish. This term therefore accounts for the axis of spins in one particular direction, which is a measure for the magnetization of the lattice. For the second term in the energy function, things shake up a little. Now the total energy is lowered by one unit when two neighboring spins point in the same direction. And similarly, two points that do not align increase the energy by the same amount. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty computation of this contribution. First, we must consider all the horizontal pairs of spins, which are easy to spot with their connecting lines. But what about the edge spins? No problem, we will simply wrap the lattice into a cylinder and connect those edge spins into further pairs. Next, we process the vertical pairs of spins. We've got the obvious ones formed between the three rows, but what about the top and the bottom spins? We'll simply wrap the lattice in the other direction. A very symmetrical interaction is provided where each spin is now paired with exactly four neighbors. And what's the fancy term for all this wrapping? It's called periodic boundary conditions. This function of energy on its own is not of much practical purpose. After all, the states of individual spins are usually uncertain and unpredictable. But for physicists, the treasure lies within the partition function. A mathematical marvel that sums up the exponential ratios of energy and temperature for all possible spin configurations. Picture this. In this model, each spin can independently take two values. This makes 2 to the 9 of 512 different spin configurations, each with their own calculated energy, governed by the external magnetic field and set into ratio with the temperature. After the summation over all spin configurations, the information of individual spins has disappeared. However, the beauty of the partition function lies in the ability to transcend individual spins and depends solely on the temperature and the external magnetic field. With the help of powerful computing tools like Mathematica, the holy grail of our model is just a few input lines away. And while this somewhat lengthy result may not seem like a revelation now, its true potential will be unleashed in its incredible predictive power. Just wait and see. You are kindly invited to join on a short sidetrack how these 512 terms can be added with the help of computer algebra. The program of choice for this animation is Mathematica, but surely any other algebra package can be used quite similarly. Nine spin variables are defined and arranged neatly within a 3x3 three three matrix. In the blink of an eye you can witness the creation of 512 spin configurations. 
four randomly chosen ones are displayed on the screen. The most challenging part, of course, is the definition of the energy function. As was presented earlier, first the nearest neighbor interaction along one row is computed. The modulus operation performs the wrapping and connects the last spin with the first one. In the next line, the interactions from one row to the next row are computed and the modulus operation makes sure that the last row is connected to the first one. As a confirmation, the function is displayed explicitly. For the interaction term with the external magnetic field, each spin variable is simply multiplied by h. The two summations are performed for each row and each element of each row. With these preparations, the partition function can be computed in one fell swoop. The sum is performed over all configurations. The second line looks awful, but it only replaces the spin variables with the corresponding ones and minus ones. That's it. In no time, the 512 terms are calculated and added. Since a lot of configurations result in the same energy, only a few terms of exponentials appear in the partition function, but the coefficients in front of the exponentials exactly sum to 512. Positive and negative exponentials can be combined into hyperbolic cosines to make the expression still a bit shorter. This summation is much more than just a mathematical exercise. It's the fundamental sum for a physical toy model that can describe phase transitions. Let's now explore how a simulation for such a 3x3 system of spins can be created. The virtual representation of the toy magnet has to contain an array of variables that keeps track of each spin state. To keep things simple, let's assign random integers to each spin with values of either positive or negative 1. The computation of the energy function repeats now for the third time. The nested for loops ensure that all spin variables in every row and every column are taken into account. In the first line of the function, each spin is multiplied by the value of its left neighbor. In the second line, each spin variable is multiplied with its upper neighbor. Python automatically accounts for periodic boundary conditions when the selected rows or columns have negative values. Finally, in the third line, the interaction with the external magnetic field is added for each spin. The magnetization is computed by the sum of all spin variables. This sum is divided by the number of spins. Therefore, the magnetization is normalized between negative and positive 1. In the displayed snapshot of the simulation, the sum of spins is negative 1, which gives a magnetization of negative 1 ninth. The simulation should reflect the physical process that occurs inside a magnet as time goes by. Instead of a continuous flow of time, it is very common to discretize time and let it evolve in steps. At each time step, 9 spins are chosen randomly and treated one after the other. The treatment starts with the calculation of the change in energy that would occur if the spin was flipped. To do so, first the left, right, upper and lower neighbor is determined. The variable dE collects the change in energy when the sign of the spin is flipped. Now there are two simple rules to follow. First, if the change in energy is negative, then the flip is performed immediately. This lowers the energy of the system and makes it more stable. The second rule accounts for the state of thermal equilibrium. Even if the change in energy is positive, there is a chance that the spin can flip nevertheless. In such a case, the required energy is obtained from the surrounding heat bath. The probability for such an energy-consuming flip is given by the exponential of the negative ratio of the change in energy over temperature. Since the change in energy is positive, this probability is small when the change in energy is large or when the temperature is low. In this particular simulation, the temperature is below the critical temperature, so that the system eventually relaxes towards a completely magnetized state. Rules 1 and 2 show how the temperature enters into the simulation. We can think of these 9 spins being surrounded by some heat bath that supplies or absorbs energy. In thermal equilibrium, the net amount of energy transfer vanishes. Amazingly, it is possible to establish a connection between this simulation and the partition function that was previously computed. Of course, even for a given temperature, the magnetization changes from time step to time step and seems completely random. 
However, the ergodic theorem of statistical mechanics allows us to connect the simulation to the partition function. The theorem states that the time average of an observable quantity approaches the ensemble average or expectation value obtained from the partition function. The time average is shown as blue curve in the left diagram. For this choice of temperature and external magnetic field, the spin sum seems to approach a value around 2. On the right side, the contributions from 512 spin configurations are added step by step. As you can see, for most of the configurations, the expectation value for the spin sum is well below zero. But even at this high temperature, the last configurations with all spins up is still the most likely one with the dominant contribution to the expectation value. All right, let's confirm this for our simulation. The magnetization is obtained from the partition function in its simplified form by computing the derivative with respect to the external magnetic field. The result is plotted as a function of temperature for the value h equals to 0.1. When the simulation is executed at different temperatures and the magnetization is averaged over a few hundred time steps, we find that the predictions of the partition function remarkably well agree with the magnetization of the simulation. Isn't it insane how the two completely different approaches lead to the same answer? Remember, the partition function is just the sum of these exponentials over all possible spin configurations. The other source of data is the tiny simulation where the nine spins are basically subject to two rules. Flip the spin when it gains energy, or maybe flip the spin when it requires energy, and the maybe is controlled by the ratio of energy and temperature. If this doesn't make you speechless, just hang on. A similar comparison of this kind will be repeated for another observable. What you've just seen in two different ways is a real-life manifestation of what physicists refer to as phase transition. Picture this. Whether it's a steel needle or a simulation of a spin system, both undergo a fascinating transformation from an organized state where every spin is aligned and the magnetization is at its peak to a chaotic phase where the magnetization reaches zero due to the spins being randomly aligned. This magnetization is what's known as order parameter of the phase transition, while the temperature acts as a control parameter. There's another physical quantity that's worth mentioning, one that's also the expected value of a random variable and can be obtained from the partition function. It's called heat capacity, and it plays a significant role in this intriguing phenomenon. Do you know the notion of heat capacity, also known as specific heat? Don't worry if you don't. Here's another simple but striking experiment. It might seem a bit unrelated, but it'll help us to learn more about phase transitions. Imagine a system of water molecules that is constantly being bombarded with energy. Here we have 500 milliliters of water and the heat transfer each second will be 1.8 kilojoule. The raise in temperature is plotted as a function of time. Until a critical temperature is reached, the obvious thing is going to happen and the temperature of the water increases linearly with time and therefore linearly with the amount of absorbed energy. Once the temperature hits 100 degrees, something remarkable occurs. Even though heat is still being absorbed, the temperature stays constant and the water undergoes a phase transition. You know it's happening when you see the vapor above the pot. It indicates that the water is violently evaporating and transforming from a liquid to a gas. This epic event is what scientists call a phase transition and it's seriously cool and hot at the same time. The easiest way to understand the meaning of heat capacity is by replacing the time with the absorbed energy and switching up the coordinate system. By doing so, we can calculate the linear slope between two points. At the beginning of our experiment, the stove had yet to heat up the water, which started at a cozy 20 degrees. After we supplied 240 kilojoules of energy, the temperature rose to the boiling point of water. The slope between these two data points is equivalent to 3 kilojoule per Kelvin. Temperature differences are typically expressed by the temperature scale Kelvin, but don't worry, 
an increase of 80 Kelvin is the same as an increase of 80 degrees of Celsius. Here's a fun fact for you. Since it is known that half a kilogram of water only needs 2 kilojoule to heat up by 1 degree, one can infer that one third of the heat was used to heat up the pot and the environment. If there was a kilogram of water instead, it would require 4 kilojoule to increase the temperature by 1 degree. This is what's usually called heat capacity or specific heat of liquid water. Since it is such an important quantity, this energy amount is usually abbreviated as 1 kilocalorie. What happens to this slope? The rise in energy per change in temperature when the water is at its boiling point? The slope and therefore the heat capacity of water is actually infinite at its boiling point. Even though heat is being transferred to the water, the temperature remains constant. This happens because the energy is being used to break the strong bounds between water molecules so they can turn into vapor. The thermal energy of individual molecules cannot increase further until all of them have completed this transition. This infinite heat capacity will be the footprint of the phase transition we will look for in the following simulations. Let's talk about how one can extract information about the heat capacity of our 3x3 spin model. Do you remember how we used the external magnetic field to obtain the expectation value for the magnetization? The expectation value for the energy can be computed quite similarly. Unlike before, the external magnetic field is unimportant. It is set to zero to simplify the expression for the partition function. Since energy always enters as a ratio with the temperature, the expectation value of the energy is obtained by differentiating the partition function with respect to the temperature. The factor of t squared compensates the corresponding term that arises from the differentiation. Additionally, to make things easier, later on we calculate the expectation value of energy per spin. Not a big deal so far, right? The next step involves differentiating the resulting expression again to compute the heat capacity. If you are into math, you love to confirm that the heat capacity is actually related to the variance of the energy. But let's forget about the details of algebra. What's really cool is how the heat capacity changes with temperature. Even in our simple 3x3 model, one can see a sharp peak in the heat capacity at the critical temperature where the transition from order to disorder occurs. In the simulation, the heat capacity is most easily computed from the time average of the energy and the square of the energy, collected in the variables E and double E. I was absolutely amazed when I first compared the simulation and the results obtained from the partition function. It was as if I had stumbled upon a secret code that unlocked the mysteries of the universe. The agreement between these two very different approaches was so perfect, it was hard to believe with my own eyes. If you have a bit of coding experience, and if you are familiar with computer algebra, I highly recommend trying this out by yourself. It's amazing to see how the sum of exponentials differentiated twice that gives rise to the yellow curve perfectly matches the behavior of the nine random spins interacting through nearest neighbor interactions. In the partition function, the temperature is the only obvious parameter. The information about the spins is completely hidden inside the coefficients. In the simulation, the temperature only controls the probability of spin flips that increase the energy of the system. Yet the two seemingly different pictures are in perfect agreement with each other. Of course, a system of nine spins cannot be the end of the story. Usually there are a few more atoms inside even a tiny magnet. So let's take a closer look and see how the partition function behaves as the size of the lattice is increased. To start things off, let's consider the modest 2x2 two two lattice. The partition function consists of three terms, each representing a different state of energy. The first term corresponds to the lowest energy states, where all spins are either up or down. At low temperature, the system is likely to occupy one of these two states. On the other hand, the second term collects the highest energy states where the spins are most disaligned. The final term sums up all 12 states of zero energy. Let's also state that at very high temperature, all exponentials basically turn into one. 
This makes it more likely to find the system in one of the 14 disordered states than in one of the states with maximum magnetization, simply because there are more of them. As we increase the lattice size step by step, the partition function includes more and more terms. For instance, the 3x3 version with the 512 possible states is familiar by now. It is feasible to continue to the sum of 65,000 configurations for the 4x4 model and with a bit of tweaking and some patience, also the 33 million configurations of the 5x5 partition function can eventually be summed. It is obvious that the expressions become more and more unpleasant. And here comes the exciting part. In 1944, Lars Onsecker performed the computation of the partition function for an infinitely large lattice and surprisingly, the expression doesn't look as daunting as you might expect. You might object that the infinite sum is replaced by an integral, but the definite integral is rather harmless. You can easily compute the partition function for each value of t in basically no time. It can even be differentiated and is quite handy for the calculation of the heat capacity. Let's have a look at the story that is told by the heat capacity per spin for the different partition functions. Isn't it amazing how smoothly each increase in lattice size slightly changes the behavior at the critical temperature until finally for the infinitely large lattice an infinite heat capacity is revealed? This is exactly what we observed from the boiling water. At the temperature of phase transition, all the absorbed energy is utilized to break the bounds between the aligned spins. The heat must overcome the nearest neighbor interactions for the system to become disordered. All the words and all the animations so far were designed to highlight the significance of the solution found by Onsager. If this hadn't been lasted for more than 30 minutes, now would be a good time to calculate this solution. However, the sum cannot be performed on the back of an envelope. It is even more involved than filing your taxes, at least for regular taxpayers. I heard about this solution four years ago and I immediately bought a textbook where it was explained. The calculation is performed on 26 pages of the book Introduction to Statistical Physics by Kersen Huang and it's by far the most involved calculation of a single task that I can remember. I quickly put the book back into the shelf, but over the years I tried it again and again, and with the idea of this presentation I finally managed to get through the 26 pages. They are partially reproduced here by permission of the Taylor and Francis group. If you want to follow my example, you can find a link for this book in the video description. What is the key idea to crack the sum? The sum is first converted into the trace of a power of A matrix. A lot of tricks are used to build this matrix out of simple spin matrices and to represent it as a rotation matrix on abstract Clifford algebras to finally get hold of the eigenvalues. In the limit of an infinitely large lattice it turns out that only the largest eigenvalue needs to be computed. As always important solutions can be obtained in various ways. There is a completely different approach to Onsaga's solution presented in Gandhi Viswanathan's blog post. It is very condensed without any illustrations and still fills about 15 pages of a book when printed. It is called combinatorical solution. The partition function is converted into a sum of graphs that are obtained when the spins are treated as vertices and the nearest neighbor interactions are treated as edges. These graphs are dynamically constructed with propagators that can create their paths step by step. The recursive relation between path amplitudes of different lengths can eventually be solved in the Fourier space. The sum over all possible paths leads to the Onsaga solution. In a second pair of comments you can select which of the two ways to Onsaga's solution sounds more appealing for you. If I prepare a second presentation on this topic, I will take your preferences into account. Apart from the two resources I just mentioned, I want to say thank you to a few more tutorial creators. During the production of this video, I learned a few more useful things working with Blender. This video is completely rendered using the fast EV engine. To achieve this, I heavily relied on a number of excellent online tutorials that taught valuable concepts. Finally, I want to express my gratitude to the organizers of the Summer of Math Exposition. This incredible event has been my main motivation for creating and presenting this material 
and I'm thrilled to be part of it for the third time. In case you've enjoyed what you've seen, please consider subscribing for more exciting content. That's all for now. I hope to see you again next time. Bye bye.